Our gospel for today comes from John, the second chapter. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now, standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk, but you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory. And his disciples believed in him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Holy God, give us grace and open our hearts and minds to hear your true and living word, Jesus the Christ, who will transform our lives. Amen. So today we're going to talk about miracles and signs and symbols. But we're going to start out by asking the question, how do we read the Bible? This is a question that's been around for easily 1,700 years or more. Ever since the stories that were written down and passed around, has this been a question? One of the forefathers of the church, Thomas Aquinas, said that we need to understand that there's at least four levels of meaning to what is written in our scripture. These levels have historical and spiritual meaning, and there's a wealth of symbolism and richness throughout. The first level is literal. It tells the story of past events and is pretty much straight up reportage. Somebody writing down their inspired experience of God or Jesus or the Holy Spirit or all three to the best of their ability and to the best that they can articulate. Now, many of you have had experiences that are hard to describe, and, and they may even sound a little wacko, <laughs> because our experiences of God are often manifested in indescribable feelings or extrasensory phenomenon. It's, it's hard to describe something that is beyond our knowing and our comprehension. And it certainly was for folks back then as well. They did the best they could. You know, it's unfortunate that many people stop with this literal level. They miss so much. The second level uh, is allegorical. This is the language of metaphor or poetry. When we speak of Jesus transforming our heart, for example, it doesn't mean that Jesus rearranges the molecules of that organ that pumps our blood. It means that Jesus changes the way we think about the world and the ways in which we respond to the world. The third level is a moral meaning, which offers us a way to live here and now. This level instructs us how to live. It's a guide to life, real examples of courses of action to take and a few not to take. The fourth level is about what is to come. It speaks to us about God's promises for the future, the kingdom of heaven and how we get there and how we can participate in it now, at this time. Quick example here. Jesus walks on the shore. He says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of people. First level. It's the story of Jesus calling his disciples. He walked on the shore. He called to the fishermen. Second level. By following Jesus, they will still be fishing, but for people. See, there's a metaphor. The third level, we should, like the disciples, listen to the voice of Jesus and obey 
without delay. And the fourth level, Jesus calls us together from whatever occupation or skills we have to serve God's purpose. Jesus calls us into a new community that is based on our new purpose, and that will give our lives new meaning. Jesus calls us, and each of us is given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good, as Paul says in our reading for today. Each one of us is given gifts for the common good that we've been called to, to bring about a better, more polite, supportive, gentle, joyful, justice-driven, peaceful, accepting world. In our gospel passage today, there are some meanings that we should bring to light. Six stone jars for the rites of purification. The way this worked is that you would wash in one, and then you'd go to the other one, and then you'd wash in the next one, progressively getting cleaner as the water gets progressively dirtier. Why six? Well, seven is the number of completeness and perfection, so six means we're almost there. And why stone? Well, Jewish understanding is that stone was purer than clay, but they were also more expensive to make, so they were luxuries. And elsewhere in the Bible, we humans are referred to as vessels, jars. And in Genesis, we are being molded from the dust of the earth. We are vessels filled with water, plain, ordinary, maybe even dirty water. Until third level, we listen to Jesus, and he transforms us into something wonderful, the best there is. And then on the fourth level, Jesus transforms us into that which will bring joy to the masses. Our purpose is to celebrate what God has done for us and to share it. We, being who we are, skeptical citizens of the 21st century, we too often spend our energy too focused on that first level. Wow, that was some miracle he did. Cool, I wish he'd work a miracle for me. Well, what is a miracle exactly? Well, we use the term as something good happening unexpectedly, as opposed to a tragedy, which is something unexpectedly bad. Um, and this is kind of an unfortunate remainder of bad theologies that have resurfaced from time to time. These are the theologies that say we receive miracles if we've been good and tragedies because we're being judged by God. And then every time that a natural disaster shows up, there's some clergy clown that pops up and says that the tornado, food, or hurricane was a judgment of God because of gambling or homosexuals or voting the wrong way. Now this is, well, let me say it pretty plainly, this is complete crap and a huge violation of the second commandment to misuse the name of the Lord or deceive by his name. It's effectively saying that we know God's unknowable mind. This goes right along with bad things happening to you because God is trying to teach you or God led Satan tempt you and you failed or God is punishing you for disobedience. This is all just plain, poor, thin, agenda-driven theology. It's the kind of theology that wants a miracle to happen just for me. John calls this event the first of Jesus' signs. So what's a sign? John has been referred to as the book of signs. Some authors contend that Jesus showed seven signs, seven being the perfect number, but Jesus did many more, as John says in his last chapter. These seven are just indicative. The purpose of the signs, then, is to bring people to belief, to confirm beliefs already held, or both. Because signs, what are signs? I mean, signs are essentially pointers. They point us toward deeper, not only theological meaning, but into a deeper appreciation of God's role in our lives. The changing of water into wine demonstrates God's power over matter and time. God can transform the humblest thing into the best, most complex, most enriching. God can transform our very essence to be a nourishment for the entire world. This sign 
points to a caring, loving God who is concerned for us and for our lives. Signs are also clues to the inbreaking or the impending arrival of the kingdom. When we are filled with God's love, there will be more than enough for us, for others. A sign is not a marvelous thing for its own sake. It's a glimpse at the goodness of God, the goodness of creation at the kingdom of heaven. Also, Jesus, who does Jesus reveal to himself, reveal himself to first? Well, to the servants, the lowly, the poor, and they listen and obey. Jesus' extravagant sign is that in him, life and joy and salvation have arrived. Signs reconnect us to the multiple layers of meaning in Scripture. The richness of this inheritance that we've received from those who first tried to describe the inherently indescribable. And this first sign perhaps represents the replacement of the Jewish ceremonial washings for purity with the creative and transforming work of Jesus to purify us. So miracles, signs, and symbols. Now, we often wonder, are miracles magic? Do they transgress the laws of nature? You know, to a person from the year 1820, pulling something from our pocket that would enable us to talk to anyone in the world would be a magical miracle that defied the laws of nature. But now it's commonplace. Can we turn water into wine? No. But then again, God's understanding of nature is better than ours since, well, you know, he created it. So Jesus may know something we don't. Did a magical miracle happen here? I don't know. And to some extent, I don't care. The importance of the event, the sign, is what it points to to the metaphoric and symbolic and deeper meanings. Just two chapters after this reading, Jesus says to a royal official in Capernaum, whose son is dying, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe, and then heals his son. And by the last chapter of John, he tells doubting Thomas that blessed are those who have seen and yet come to believe. That should be us. John is layering, John is layering meaning on meaning in his writing. So, as he says at the end of the book, so that Jesus provided far more God-revealing signs than are written down in this book. These are written down so you will believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and in your act of believing, you will have real and eternal life in the way that he personally revealed it. John's use of signs directs us to a transcendent reality, to that of God's own self. The signs direct us on our path of growth through all the stages of our faith life. If we get caught up or stuck in the magical miracles, we're, we're on the wrong track. Faith is not a once and done thing. It's a growth and a progression that, takes, that comes from a willingness to see and hear the continuous activity of God, to do our best to open our hearts and minds to God's true and living word, Jesus the Christ, who will transform our lives. Amen.
Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks Thanks be be to to God. God. Safe in your hands.